What's up my non-drummer friends? In this video, we are going to be diving into all of the different components that make up a drum kit. And since this is the non-drummer's guide, I'm gonna be doing so in a way that only captures the information that benefits you as a producer or an engineer or a non-drummer of any kind. Now, never let yourself get caught in a situation where you can't convey an idea to your session drummer or you can't get a beat that's in your head out and into production because we're just maybe need a little bit of a refresher as far as the components go that are involved in a drum part. Now, here we go. So, pedal boards. Back in the day, those were my equivalent of like a slurpy brain freeze. Uh, whenever I would ask my guitar player buddies uh, about guitar sounds, uh, and he or she would proceed to uh, start pointing his or her toe down to the little cockpit of flashy, stomping, clicking things, uh, my eyes would kind of glaze over a little bit and my brain would turn into a little bit of a knot. Uh, just wasn't my world. I was interested, but again, just not my world. So I would smile and nod and throw out a sounds awesome, uh, compliment whatever they were doing because it typically was pretty badass. Uh, but I just wasn't familiar with what was going on down there. And this would be way before we would get to amps, holy shit. But anyways, we're musicians and we love gear and we love talking about it. So whenever that can of worms got opened up, I knew it was time to order myself another drink at the bar and sit back and get ready for the ride. Uh, anyhow, over the years I started to pick up bits and pieces of info about pedal boards and they don't really scare me so much anymore. And I still wouldn't have any clue of how to work one, but at least I can have a, an intelligent conversation with a guitar player friend of mine uh, about what kinds of sounds they're working with and what they're doing. I wish I had that info a little bit, uh, you know, years ago, and I could have spoken with a little bit more confidence in those situations, but we learned things along the way. But based on some feedback that I've received, uh, this video is going to be a comprehensive, quick breakdown of the drum kit. Um, and so I can, we can make sure that you don't have to experience what I went through back then when it comes to your knowledge of the drum kit. So that said, this video is going to be very short and to the point. So let's go ahead and dive in. So to start, drum kits can actually get pretty crazy and some drummers prefer a rather expansive setup like these guys. But don't stress over these types of kits and all the worldly drums and crazy amounts of cymbals. Uh, let's keep it simple and practical. Those guys are awesome, by the way, nothing against that. But 99% of the drumming you hear in most modern day music really only comes from six different components of the drum kit. So a basic understanding of these six components will actually really go a long way. Now, conveniently enough, they all break down into two pretty easy categories. We've got our woods, And then we've got our metals. Now that said, these six components include the kick drum, the snare drum, the toms, the hi-hats, the ride cymbal, and then crash cymbals. And now let's go into some more detail on what each of these components actually are. Now first, let's go into the woods. Let's talk about the kick, the snare, and those toms. So starting with the kick drum. Almost all of us know what the kick drum is. We're familiar with it. Uh, it's the big drum that sits sideways on the floor and it gets played with a beater that's attached to a pedal. Uh, the kick drum is what produces that super low, quick, fat punch that we hear all the time in almost every style of music. In dance music, for example, we hear a lot of the kick drum pounding in 4-4 quarter notes underneath the music. It's called four on the floor. And in other styles of music, uh, the kick drum uh, mainly complements uh, the groove that the bass player is playing. Now, musically, it's a very powerful drum that can have a huge impact on the personality and the feel of a tune. So if you play it heavy on the downbeats and you throw your song into overdrive and the song has an unmistakable forward, forward motion, that's four on the floor, check it out. Now, if you play a more syncopated pattern and you can give your music a much different feel, check this out. Mm -hmm. 
Now a cool note about the kick, uh, this is the drum that gets people's heads bobbing and oftentimes will dictate the way people are dancing. Seriously, think about it next time you're at a live show. Take a look around at some of the people that are dancing and moving along. More often than not, they're going to be stepping to the rhythm of the kick drum. Now, here are some main takeaways that you can keep with you for your next production. Uh, make sure that the kick is complementing the bass player's part. Super important. And unless you have a four on the floor dance groove, uh, then generally you won't really be having the kick drum and the snare drum hitting simultaneously at any point in the music. So keep that one in mind too. All right, let's start talking about our snare drum. Uh, this is a very, very important drum in the drummer's setup. Uh, so much so that it's often considered to be the drummer's voice. So no wonder why so many of us uh, get so particular over our snare drums. That's uh, one drum that we never leave the house without when we're off to a gig or a session somewhere. Now, the snare drum is the one that's going to be sitting right in the drummer's lap, and it's going to be making that high, loud crack that we all know and love. Check it out. It's an extremely dynamic drum, and a lot of drummers, engineers, and producers will obsess over the snare sound before even dialing in the rest of the kit sound. Its effect on the song is actually that powerful. And in some other videos, I'll be digging in a lot more on how playing this drum can have a very drastic impact on the feel and the personality and movement of the song. Be sure to check those out. But as far as uh, the main takeaway for this video, I would say that if you are going to be programming your drum tracks, uh, really try and get your hands on a real live snare drum sample and try to stick with something that's going to be pretty middle of the road in pitch. Uh, in my experience, snare samples that are either really high pitch or super deep and low are often the ones that stick out as being kind of fake and really having a programmed sound to them. This has to do with the lack of bleed of, or presence of that snare sound in other mics on a drum kit in the studio, uh, which kind of helps it fit into the drum sound as a unit. On their own in a program part, they kind of seem to stick out a little bit like a sore thumb if they're really high or really low. Again, that bleed is kind of what gives that snare a presence in the whole drum sound. And now let's move on to our toms. These drums are a lot of fun. Of all the types of drums that make up the drum kit, these ones are actually the ones that are gonna be played the least. They come in a bunch of different sizes and the size or the diameter of the drum is what's going to determine its pitch, uh, along with the tension of the drum head too. Uh, some drummers go crazy with how many toms uh, or how many of these drums they have on their kit, and others keep it rather simple, like me. I just use two of them most of the time. So there are the ones that sit right on top of the kick drum, uh, and we call these ones the rack toms. Uh, sometimes people might refer to them as the hanging toms or the mounted toms, all of which basically just imply that they're suspended and they're gonna be over the kick. These ones are gonna be smaller in diameter, uh, commonly anywhere between eight inches and 13 inches, and will produce higher notes. And then we have the floor toms. Uh, these ones are much larger in diameter, oftentimes anywhere from 14 to 18 inches is common, and they produce much lower tones. These drums are a lot of fun to play, again, and we will be getting into how toms can be incorporated into your drum parts in later videos as well. Uh, now for this video though, uh, as a main takeaway for you, if you are a studio engineer, then just know that every tom has a natural range that it is going to sound its best in. So don't try and fight with a tom via tuning to get it to sound like something that it's not supposed to. And now another point is, if you're a producer, for, for example, and writing music, just know that the toms are used very seldom throughout most songs as a whole. Uh, so if you're composing or producing a song, unless it's super obvious that like, oh yes, this is absolutely a tom part and this is a great place for toms, then chances are then you might not want to use them there. So that wraps up our woods. Now let's move on to our metals and we'll talk about the cymbals now. <clears throat> so to start, let's talk about the hi-hats. Uh, these cymbals come in pairs and they sit on a stand that is operated by a foot pedal. Uh, the point of the foot pedal is to either lift the cymbals apart or to close them shut. And now doing so changes the sound that they make when the drummer actually hits them. 
Uh, these are a lot of fun to play, as everything is. Um, and here's a little interesting tidbit, though. Uh, when it comes to the number of notes played in a drum part, these cymbals, along with the ride cymbal, which I'll talk to in a second, are going to be played the most. Uh, you, you're going to hear these all the time. Uh, they're going to be the ones that make that sound. It's going to be like a t -t 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 type thing. Uh, they're extremely important and one of the two common surfaces uh, that a drummer is going to carry out an ostinato on. And now just as a refresher, an ostinato just simply means a repeating musical phrase or figure in the music. Now here's a couple examples of some really common ostinatos that I'm sure you've heard. Check it out. There you go, ostinato, fancy word, but that's really all they are. Now the hi-hats uh, are very, have a very significant impact on the feel and the movement of a tune, uh, and they're a great tool for creating different types of feels and emphasizing the development of a piece of music. So much so that I have a whole other series just digging into the depth and importance of just these two symbols. Now as a main takeaway for this video though, uh, I would say that Super loud hi-hats are really annoying in a mix, uh, so don't kill your listener with them. Keep them soft, keep them classy, and keep them subtle. And secondly, uh, try not to make them too busy. Uh, if your song is mostly in eighth notes, um, then playing a bunch of sixteenth notes uh, just might be a little bit too much and not be appropriate. Uh, but use your ear though, and remember, if it sounds good, it is good. Okay, ride cymbal. The ride symbol is likely going to be the largest symbol on the family of symbols of the kit. It is generally going to be a thicker symbol and, like the hi-hat, will have the most notes played on it. They're going to go back and forth. Again, this is because of the ostinato placement. Now, the ride symbols are kind of a second to the snare drum uh, in terms of the diversity of the sounds that they're going to make. Uh, high quality ride cymbals are often handmade, hand hammered, uh, so they're like snowflakes or zebras in that no two are going to sound exactly alike. I personally am a ride cymbal nerd. I love them and I totally geek out at all the different sounds that they can make and how they can impact uh, the overall drum kit sound in a mix. It's really freaking cool. All that aside though, the ride cymbal is going to be, uh, it's going to produce a more direct, sharper, and defined cymbal sound uh, that sustains quite a bit with a very defined attack. Uh, whereas our hi-hats made that sound, uh, comparatively the ride cymbal would be making more of a ting sound. Uh, it takes a few seconds to totally die out and decay as well. It's really beautiful sound. Now the main takeaways for this video, uh, kind of the same as the snare, if you need to program your drum parts, be really selective of your ride cymbal. Really serious about this one. If you're going for a real drummer type sound, then getting this one wrong will be the dead giveaway that these tracks are programmed. So spend some extra time getting something that sits really nicely in your mix. Also like the snare, uh, try and avoid high pitched rides. Uh, even though you might want something slightly more pingy for your song, uh, go a couple steps lower because for some reason those are the ones that also always sound kind of fake if you're going for that real drum sound. 
All right, now let's talk about the crash symbol. Crash symbols are also larger symbols like our rides. They'll often range anywhere from like 16 to 20 or 22 inches in diameter. And like the toms, the diameter of them is going to kind of dictate its pitch. The smaller ones are gonna be higher and splashier, and the larger ones are gonna be lower and kind of uh, a little darker. Now the crash symbol lives up to its name. Sonically, uh, because the sound that it makes is literally going to be like the word crash. Check it out. So there you go. Easy to remember if you ever forget it, just the sound that it makes. Of the three types of symbols that we're covering in this video, the crash symbol is going to be the one that is going to be the least played. It's often used to mark section changes or to emphasize the beginning or end of a musical phrase, for example. They're like a musical street sign or like an exclamation point. Uh, they're going to let you know when you've arrived someplace, like a street sign does, or they're going to allow you to make a strong point with the drums and the music, like an exclamation point. Now, used correctly, they can also be a great tool for supporting the development and the shape of the piece of music. And I'll be digging into that a little bit further in some other videos. Stay tuned for that. But as far as your main takeaway for this one, just make sure that you don't overuse these. Again, we use them the least of all the symbols on our drum kit when we're playing a live kit. And now another thing, if you're programming your drum parts, like the ride symbol, uh, just try not to use something that's too high pitch if you're going for a realistic sound. Uh, when you're mixing a programmed crash, also try not to pan it super hard right or left. On a real drum kit, having a crash symbol super isolated to either left or right, it just would never happen because both the left and the right overhead mic is going to be picking up that sound. So make sure that when you're programming it and you're mixing it, make sure that it's coming out of both the right and the left in your stereo mix to get that realistic sound. All right, now that concludes the breakdown of the six elements that make up a drum kit. Again, 99% of the drumming that you hear in most modern music is just gonna be coming from these six different components. So now that you have a clear understanding of what they are, you can have a more effective and efficient conversation with your drummer or just be able to jog your memory when you're programming something. However, keep in mind, uh, we drummers, uh, like guitar players, can also geek out over equipment. So if you wanna come talk to us, make sure you go hit the bar beforehand and get yourself another drink because you might be in for chit chatting a little longer than you signed up for. And it doesn't also hurt to buy the drummer a drink as well. Uh, now I hope you find the information in this video helpful. And if you do, please make sure to subscribe below and keep in touch with me. Uh, as always, if you are ever in need of a real live session drummer, uh, and custom drum tracks, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, my contact information can be found in the description below, and I would love to help you out. And lastly, uh, I do have an ebook and an accompanying video series dedicated to my non drummer friends. Uh, it is titled Five Ways to Get Unstuck When You're Making and Writing Drum Parts. It's an in depth toolkit designed to help non drummers get past those unexpected hurdles and production hurdles when you're in the moment in the studio mid-project, either face-to-face -face with your session drummer or hands on the MIDI drum pads and ready to go. It's intended to help you program more meaningful, deep drum tracks and also through communicating more effectively with your session drummer, those ideas. And based on the feedback that I've received from the book, uh, folks seem to think that it applies to a lot more than just drum tracks, kind of any instrument track. So that's really cool. That's an added bonus. Um, it's totally free. It's my gift to you. And you can download it at the link below in the description. Let me know what you think about it. Now, thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it and look forward to talking to you soon.